Yes, Thank you. thanks for the introduction and the invitation to be here. So I'm going to speak about structural biology in the clouds and uh, think of cloud in the context of the European Open Science Cloud. So it's HPC, it's HTC, it's grid, it's cloud, it's, it's everything. Uh, we're not really doing HPC in what we are doing, but more high throughput. And as the title uh, says, we have been doing that since quite some time in different contexts. So I'm based in Utrecht, not so far from here, in a university. Uh, and we have always been doing kind of computing in the context of an experimental infrastructure. So from the start of, of all the, say, EU-related e-infrastructure business we have been doing, we had an audience, we had users, basically, because people were coming to our infrastructure to measure and they need to process their data. So this has kick-started very much uh, everything that we have been doing over the years. So what's the, the field, what's the topic? Well, life sciences uh, with all the genomic information and we are trying to add the structural dimension to this information and more, not so much to the genome, but to the proteome and the interactome, the interactions between all the molecules that come out of that. And that's the field of structural biology and you need computing to interpret your data. And these days you need more and more integration of different methods to get to the answers that you are looking at. So there's no single experimental techniques that will allow you to to, to get to the answer that you want. So you need to combine techniques and you need to use computations also in that process. So I'm just wondering. So, uh, so what we are uh, doing also, especially in my group, to speak a little bit about the software before going to the, uh, to the more the, the cloud containers aspect. So we are trying to predict interactions between biomolecules and uh, trying to see uh, using data, but using computing, uh, to do this kind of process. So it's typically, uh, it, we are not running HPC simulations for uh, months to, to do this. It's more like a high throughput a computing problem where you need to do a lot of computation and repeat those to get, uh, to get data. It's a bit similar to some of this uh, binding affinity where you have to do large of a number of computation, although our computations are typically rather very short. So it's more the volume that, that counts than the, the length. Um, and in my group, we developed a software called Haddock for, for doing that. And Haddock has been one of the major drivers behind everything that we've been doing within uh, WeNMR uh, to make use of uh, high throughput computing data. So I'm just wondering if I started the right presentation now. I need to check that because it's a weird, oh, it's, uh, it's the right one. It's just the statistics are not up to date. So basically, uh, uh, we have more than 13,000 registered users uh, of our uh, software. Uh, so we are 225 runs that have been running and we have now about 40% of all the computations that we've been doing since the server is up, which is about 10 years now. 40% has been running on the uh, grid HTC resources and this number is increasing because most of our users are redirected to the, to the grid. Actually, the user, they don't care where they run, they want to get their data. So we have different version of the portal running some of them are running on our local infrastructure, which are just like classical clusters. Uh, and we can redirect from one to the other, depending if we run into problems. And we have even duplications without, within our, our computing. So we have several clusters. At the end, it's only important that the user gets his results. And uh, where it gets them from doesn't matter that much. So, so where is this? all coming from. So first of all, we also have a large user base. So it's not just Europe, it's European say, research and project, but the user base is all over the, the world. And we have more than, uh, really wondering about this presentation. This is not what I, hmm. Is this really containerization? This is not the right one. Or if it's the right one, it has been overwritten by something else. Let me just check something. This looks very different. And I only have one presentation open. And it shows me very different ones. OK, let's move to that one. That's very weird. There was only one file open, and it's or it has linked to something or something else. 
So, okay, so these are the current statistics. I apologize for the mess here. Uh, so we've been doing all this business for, for more than 10 years now. And this has been made possible through high throughput computing resources provided by different, uh, not only H2020, but FP7 as well over the years. So it all started with WeNMR, and WeNMR is like an old brand name, but it still survived because WeNMR is now integrated in the European Open Science Hub a project as a thematic service. Uh, so we are a thematic service provider. Actually, before WeNMR, there was ENMR, so the W was added uh, to in integrate worldwide, not only Europe. Uh, there was a virtual research environment project that came out of uh, WeNMR one year later. Uh, we got involved in EGI Engage. Uh, we were involved in the Indigo Data Cloud, and here comes a bit of containerization out of this project that we have been implementing. And now we are part of the Open, European Open Science Cloud project. Uh, so this is all these have been supporting actually uh, the operation of our services and also the development of of tools and services, but not so much the software. The software is also supported. Uh, by Instruct and by another center of excellence, uh, by Excel. So there we also have to think about uh, exascale, but the exascale will not come from running uh, one big ad hoc calculations on thousands of cores. It will run, but it will come from running a large volume of different problems uh, to address an interactome, for example. So it's more in the massive amount of, of, of runs that you would have to do and the massive amount of data that you would have to handle where the exascale component comes. And at some point, we, are, we will run into problem with data more than with the CPU, actually, because we are typically, all computations are generating a lot of small files. And uh, already at SurfSAR, we are running into trouble to do machine learning because the, the inodes limits are set in such a way that we cannot even upload all the images that we need to process. So, so there are things, there are these kind of things that you are running into when you're moving. So we NMR, this is the current entry point for the community. So uh, that's uh, uh, where users will find all kind of information about the services that we're running, but also the tutorials. Uh, so this was the number of users uh, of our services some time ago. Uh, so it's still uh, going up and, and, and running. And these are only the statistics for the services that we are operating in Utrecht, but WNMR is more than just Utrecht. We have partners in Italy as well that are providing services. Just to show you the, the usage, so this is the number of, uh, of grid jobs, actually, uh, over the 10 years. And this is stopping at the end of 2017. But so this was the first project. Uh, then we had WNMR, where things were growing, end of funding. We started EGI Engage. We started Westlife. And now we are in the post-Westlife in the EOS hub uh, era. And uh, the, the usage has been growing uh, over the years, even in cases where we were we had no funding. So there were periods in there where there was no funding. And it, we kept running the services and offering them for free to the users so that we don't lose the community. And I think that's, uh, you can have a fantastic software, but if nobody uses it, it's completely useless. So usage is important. Uh, the servers might be operated in different places. Uh, it's not one location. It's not one entry point, but they have the same look and feel, which makes them recognizable uh, as a brand to the external users. So in terms of challenges to, to do this kind of uh, services over the years, so, so you need users. I already made the point. I think without users, without usage of your services, uh, you are wasting money. So that's um, more about the, the, the impact. But the other part is that you need to offer software which is state of the art. People will not come to your service because you can use it for free, but they want to come because they want to use the say, top of the line software for what they want to do. And another challenge is that you need to operate and keep all this infrastructure running. And that's, uh, that's where containers comes to a handy. So containerization for running services, for a long time we have not been doing that. But uh, partly in the context of the BioXL Center of Excellence, we've also been completely rewriting the front end of Haddock. Most of our users are interacting with the web portal, so there's a software behind the portal. But we have been completely rewriting it, uh, offering new options, and it's written in the Flask framework. And now, actually, the portal, before it was just running you know, at Apache, HTML code, PHP code, something on, a, on the server. And now everything is containerized. So we are using, basically, Docker containers and Docker Swarm. 
so we use three containers to run the portal. One is providing the static content and the authentication. One is really serving the portal. So that's what the users see. And one is running the database for our user data. Uh, so we have to keep track of these 13,000 users and offer a proper registration system. We had to put a lot of effort in that because of the GDPR last year to, to revise everything and make sure that all the privacies are, are there. So because of that, now it's very easy to, uh, to, to update or to do additions to the server, run a de devil instance of the server uh, and test it if it's running or not. Uh, we were also a pilot project in the Edix Nebula, it was mentioned, I think, in the first talk uh, today, where we were given a cluster in the cloud, so kind of a mini HPC cluster in the cloud, and we just deployed our Docker-based uh, server, and we had very quickly something running that we could use and, and provide to the users. So that worked uh, also very well. So it makes our life easier, and this will be uh, very valuable for, for the future and for the other servers. So we are slowly migrating most of our servers to such uh, containerization. Uh, some of the things that we are doing also in the context of EOS Hub is to make the life of users easier. So integrating a single sign-on, like the EGI check-in, has been done. Now, in terms of using resources, uh, doing the computing using containers, uh, Mainly for the Indigo Data Cloud project, we have been uh, harvesting GP GPU resources on a grid. So we're actually piloting the use of GPU resources on a grid during that project and um, using Dockers. So we are two of our portal actually harvesting GP GPU resources. They can run on CPUs, but uh, the software can run on GPUs, and we are making it much more efficient on GPUs. So one is about visualization of, of, of data, of information that you have, and the other one is about uh, fitting structure into cryo-electron microscopy data, low resolution one, where you have to, to do a full search of the space in terms of translation rotations. And these are problems that you can quite easily port to, to GPUs. These are very efficient problems for GPUs. So this is kind of the architecture behind our portals. Uh, uh, most portals are, are functioning in this way, so the user will only see an, uh, an input point and uh, it's presented with results at the end. Uh, and what's happening, uh, we have a lot of validation. Uh, you want those things to run even if you go on vacation for one month and, and nobody's in the lab, those things should run without problems. So you have to do heavy validation in what the users are doing. Uh, you need the authentication. They are typically pre-processing happening on local resources. So we need resources to run all those services and then things are sent either on CPUs typically or local resources or we send them to the grid uh, for, for computing. Uh, and the grid could also be cloud these days, so we use Dirac for EGIs as a way of submitting the jobs and Dirac for EGI can now automatically start uh, cloud VMs and uh, for us it's a transparent way of using cloud resource. So if tomorrow all the grid resources disappear and everything has to be cloud-based, we can use the same submission mechanism and will not suffer from it. So that's, that's a major uh, thing for us. Um, and at the end, most portals also do some post-processing, which is local, and present the results. Now, to run these, uh, uh, these calculations, uh, you need to have quite a number of libraries. And this becomes complicated if you want to access grid sites where you don't have no control of the software installed. Uh, of the local libraries. So we're using uh, CVMFS as a way of deploying the software on all grid sites. We only need to maintain one copy and it's distributed everywhere. But you still often have dependencies <coughs> which will be on the local system. And to run this kind of, uh, these two portals, we need uh, to have uh, fast Fourier transformation. You need to have the libraries to, to access the, the, the GPU, so OpenCL. Uh, so it's a lot of libraries that you need to install, and you cannot require some site administrator to start doing that for you if they are not there. So because of that, we started packaging all of that in, uh, in Docker containers, and uh, this was made through the Indigo Data Cloud project, and they are actually in the, in the Docker hub of, uh, of Indigo Data Cloud. Now we're using, so the security issues were mentioned in the previous talk, so HPC side don't like Docker, but in the context of the Indigo Data Cloud project, it was uDocker developed, which does not require root access to the system. So you can run it as a user 
in a system without, and so you don't have these security issues. So in principle, uh, HPC site admin should be accepting Docker containers provided they are running them using uDocker instead of the, the regular Docker because this does not provide the security issue anymore. Um, and this is what we have been using on the grid. So there are only few sites on the grid that are actually giving you access to uh, GPGPU resources today. So there are not a lot of them. So one site is in Florence and one was uh, maybe at UCL even in, in London. I know there was a London site that was uh, giving us access to those resources. So basically, uh, we will be pooling the images or storing them locally. And when a job score name, uh, the image is used, it's connected to the hardware to run the jobs, and we don't have uh, to install any local software, provided uDocker is there on the site. So it's a nice way of accessing GPU resources on the grid. So do you take a hit in performance by using containers to, to access GPUs on the grid? Uh, so this was tested using different uh, uh, graphical card GPUs. Uh, so we tested on bare metal, we, did dust, uh, we tested using Docker containers, and we tested also on cloud system. And you see here the, the timing for uh, one of these applications. Uh, so this is uh, the comparison CPU to GPU, just in terms of what's the, the, how much do we win by running on the GPUs. And the comparison, so the first two lines will be here cloud. And you see that you basically don't lose anything by running on the cloud. So accessing the GPU through the cloud VM or accessing the GPU through the Docker containers on the grid. So we don't take a hit, and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, we also use containers actually to, uh, so we implemented a continuous integration pipeline for those uh, two codes, meaning that if we make a feature fix uh, on the software level on GitHub, it will automatically trigger for Jenkins the creation of a new Docker container, uh, which will be pushed to the Jenkins preview and pulled to test the application. And there's a test being done, do you get the same results? Because this computing, in principle, if you, you have the same input, you should get exactly the same result. So we can automatically, from a fix at the software level, go all the way to the building of the container, testing of the feature. And if everything is, uh, is fine and pass the review test, then you can basically put the new container into uh, production, and it will appear on the Docker Hub of Indigo. And we have now implemented a similar mechanism uh, for the web portal of Haddock. So if we do new changes to the portal, it will automatically uh, build uh, the Docker images that are associated with the portal. And we run a number of internal texts, uh, including submission of data to the portal to make sure that we are getting the proper result. So for that, we are running our own instance of, of Jenkins in, in Utrecht. And we hope to do more of that in the future. And also, I think the big advantage is you don't depend on, on the hardware on which we're running. Uh, so we've been, in conclusion, running uh, an infrastructure for more than, for structural biology for more than 10 years. So WeNMR was an early adapt adopter of and driver of new technology. So the, the, we were the first one to actually use GP, GPU resources on the grid and also uh, test and, and develop the methods to be able to do that in a safe way. And uh, migration of our servers and services to containers will facilitate the future deployment and operation of services. So already with SurfSAR, there was the Elix Nebula project discussion. Uh, so we are very also using the infrastructure here at SurfSAR as our entry point to the, to the grid. Uh, we're also using uh, some of the clusters here and resource also next door at Nikkei for our heavy supporters of what we are doing, but you can Indeed, in the future, with what is happening in the cloud moving to HPC, you could think, should you have, do you still need your own cluster in your cluster room downstairs somewhere to operate those services, or is a cloud instance good enough to, to do that? And uh, for that, it will be important to be able to automate all those deployments. Because you, when you have old cluster, you, you are unable to update anymore the system at some point, and you have all kind of dependencies. And when you start from scratch to deploy everything in a new cluster, you hit all kind of walls, things that you never thought of. And by using containers to deploy those services, this should go much smoother and facilitate our task in the future. OK, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and Jörg and Michael are the two who have been doing a lot of work for all this containerization of our services and portals. <laughs>